the ideas I present here will be um, useful in developing a foundation for um, the extension of these ideas to sequences um, that Eli will present in the following seminar. So stick around for that. Okay, so what I'm mostly going to be talking about today is uh, the analysis of biological sequences using generative models. Um, so the idea here is to take um, a bunch of sequences, usually say protein homologs from across life or RNA homologs, and then um, derive biological insight from sequences alone uh, often. Um, so our lab has been quite successful in doing this in a number of ways. So um, some of the things we've been able to derive from sequence alone is structure, interactions, and dynamics of proteins, and um, also um, intermolecular interactions um, between protein protein or protein RNA. Um, a few weeks ago, you also heard Johnny Nafolda talk about how uh, they were able to go just from protein sequences to determine whether coding variants in the human genome were pathogenic or not. Um, and also, um, at that same time, you heard uh, June talk about uh, their work on developing nanobody libraries uh, using generative models um, and optimizing sequences. So, what is generative modeling of um, biological sequences? Well, it's a two-part recipe. Um, the first part is, you know, you take your sequences that you wish to analyze. These are usually protein homologs from across life, um, homologs of a particular protein, I mean. Um, and the other part is a generative model. And what a generative model is, is essentially a probabilistic description of um, the distribution of the sequences in your data set. Um, and that can be written as such, as a probability, um, of your sequences uh, given um, uh, parameters theta here. And fitting um, a generative model for protein sequences or any sort of biological sequences are, is the same as fitting any generative model for any sort of data, including um, you know, say one-dimensional data. So in analogy to how you would fit a Gaussian to real numbers, um, you can fit your generative sequence model to biological sequences. In this case, um, for the Gaussian, you know, your parameters are the location and scale parameter. Um, so some examples of generative sequence models are um, your HMMs. Um, so HMMs describe, um, so to fit an HMM, you essentially uh, learn the ancestral sequence and prescribe some certain probability to mutations or, or SNPs or indels. Um, there's also energy-based models, um, such as the PLUS model, which include epistasis between residues, which HMMs cannot do. Um, there's other models as well, um, such as alignment BAEs, which um, Johnny Mafalda presented on um, a few weeks ago. Um, recently, there's been natural language processing models that have been um, used as well that June presented at that same time. Um, okay. So once you fit your generative model, how do you go to derive biological insight? And um, for example, those, that list of things I gave in the previous slide, well, there's two methods. Um, the first is, you know, you fit these parameters and often these parameters are interpretable. For example, in the POTS model, some of the parameters describe correlations between certain residues. And so you can assume that if two residues are highly correlated, um, then uh, you can infer something about the structure. Um, but also, you know, you have this probability and um, you can derive insight from the probability um, directly. So for example, um, uh, if you see a mutation that decreases the probability of a sequence, you can assume that um, some sort of um, evolutionary constraint has been violated. And so um, that mutation might be deleterious. And so in this way, you can derive um, the ability to design sequences um, insight about pathogenicity, which variants could be pathogenic, and also um, ability uh, to derive insight as to which parts of the sequence are important and um, you know, have certain function. So these are the two ways you can derive biological insight from your fit models. OK, so so far you've noticed I've mostly been talking about protein and RNA sequences and not you know, genomes. Um, so why is that the case? Well, um, to explain that, I'll need to introduce the idea of model misspecification. Um, so here's an example of model misspecification in one dimension. Model misspecification is essentially when the model you're trying to fit cannot possibly fit the data. So the example here is, um, you know, trying to fit a Gaussian to bimodal data. And so um, the consequences of trying to fit a Gaussian to bimodal data is that the um, parameters you fit, for example, the mean and standard deviation, aren't necessarily going to be 
as easily interpretable, right? For example, the mean isn't going to um, be a measure of centrality of the data in this case, um, but also the density estimation is going to be quite poor. Um, as you can see, of course, the Gaussian doesn't really describe where the data is. Um, so how does this manifest in biological sequences? Well, biological sequence data sets are incredibly complicated. Um, to avoid like the extremely complicated examples of cancer and um, chromothripsis, here are two really common ones that people are interested in. Immune locus gene products, such as antibodies, undergo really complicated um, recombination and rearrangement. Um, but also something just as complicated, just as common as like the ensemble of Arabidopsis genomes is super variable, undergoes like really complicated structural rearrangements, including uh, involving transposons and deletions and rearrangements. And this is just in normal Arabidopsis. So um, it's sort of hard to believe that any existing parametric model can fit these sorts of data. I mean, um, especially the plant genomes, which are just colossal to begin with. Um, and so one way you might want to think about misspecification for biological models is, you know, missing some effect or phenomenon in the data that, um, you know, isn't accounted for by the model. So one example of this in um, uh, the last slide would be something like epistasis, where the POTS model can describe um, epistasis between certain residues um, of the protein, while an HMM cannot. But uh, for these um, sequence data sets shown here, um, there's much more complicated um, phenomenon that can be accounted for by, um, that are difficult to imagine um, integrating into a parametric model, such as incredibly complicated deletions and assertions, recombination, rearrangement that are actually just still being resolved, um, you know, in recent papers, let alone, you know, fully described and their probabilistic uh, distributions described. So how is um, the current field um, dealing with misspecification right now? Well, um, they're trying to build more and more complicated models or more and more flexible models, I should say. Um, so a few weeks ago, you heard um, June talk about um, they're building up um, dilated convolutional neural networks for the analysis of nanobody sequences, which include highly variable regions, which couldn't be adequately described by um, POTS models or alignment-based models. And so um, the idea there was that, you know, these neural networks are a lot more flexible than um, those alignment-based models. And um, you know, there are other groups as well that are focusing on natural language processing models. And these figures you can see are very detailed and all those details are in service of like building the most flexible complicated model imaginable. And um, you know, these have been uh, proved great for uh, analyzing more complicated protein sequences, but you know, there's still a large gap between um, nanobodies and full genomes, which are just like you know, their own, um, you know, really out there. So um, one question you might want to ask if you want to um, scale up these generative models to full genomes is, you know, is your neural network flexible enough, right? You can apply a neural network um, to a genome, and then you can ask, you know, did I get close to fitting the data or not, right? And so um, one question you want to ask is, how do we measure misspecification once you fit the model? And um, if you're familiar with the Cole Margrove Smirnoff test, you can you know, sort of think, oh yeah, well, you know, it's certainly possible to measure misspecification, but if you want to refute the idea that your model is misspecified, it can be a little bit more difficult, right? Because you need to come up with the, uh, you need to show the existence of another model that can do better. And so this question is somewhat difficult, um, but let me ask an even more ostentatious question, you know, can we avoid misspecification entirely? Um, and if we can, can we do it um, while preserving interpretability. Now, I remember a few slides ago, I talked about how there's two different ways to derive biological insight from these generative models, from the parameters and also from the density estimation. Um, these models on this slide um, sort of do away with that first one and focus mostly on density estimation. And so um, uh, something we might be interested in if we're trying to avoid misspecification is um, preserving um, interpretability in the model, just keeping the model simple. So is this possible? Intuitively, no, right? Because you know we've all heard that phrase: no model is perfect, no model is actually can actually describe the data. But in reality, the answer is yes. Actually, we can completely avoid misspecification um, while preserving interpretability. Now that's quite the statement. So um, the rest of the talk will be in service of showing that this is true and um, how one might go about doing this. 
in the one-dimensional data case. Okay, so why am I talking about one-dimensional data? Um, well, on one hand, um, the story I'll go through here um, and the model I'll develop is almost identical to um, the model Eli will describe in the following seminar for sequences. And so everything will look super familiar. Um, but on the other hand, um, the operations and abilities of this um, super flexible non-parametric model are, I think, much more intuitive on 1D um, data than on sequences. Well, what, um, do you mean, what do you mean the 1D case? Sorry, if this was in the first two minutes, I apologize. Oh, no, no, no. The 1D case, I mean, um, non-parametric density estimation where your data is one dimensional, not sequences. And I'm really oh, talking oh, like- oh. Uh, Continuous yeah. one dimensional densities. Let's estimate yes. them. Okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that is what the rest of the talk will be in service of, just building up this model. And it will look very familiar when Eli builds up virtually the same model for sequences. And um, so let's get started. Okay, I'm gonna be writing on the slide. I thought that if I just put up a bunch of LaTeX, then uh, you might leave the meeting. So I'll be doing this by hand. So here is our setup. Okay. We have a bunch of data. Xi generated from some probability distribution, Iid. And these are real numbers, Xi. And at the same time, we have a model class. And this is P theta or theta in big theta. So this is a model class. And what's really important about this model class is that it is expertly designed. What this means is that on one hand, um, it's interpretable. So it is pretty simple. On the other hand, um, you know, it's reasonable. Well, let me say reasonable. Um, in that some of the phenomena that are that you expect in the actual um, data are accounted for by the model. And here's our goal. Come up with a Q which is similar to P. So we want to estimate our density, but we want to involve data somehow. So we can get that interpretability. Again, okay, what does model misspecification mean in this case? Um, it just means that P theta doesn't equal theta, uh, doesn't equal P for every theta. Oh, for all. Um, theta. Okay. That is our setup in math. Okay. Um, let me redraw so, this. Sorry. Movie. So the last yes. thing you mean that, that the given distribution that the data is drawn from is simply not, not modeled. It's not a member of exactly. the, the, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So let me do this in cartoon form. Um, so I can sort of describe uh, our solution. Um, so what is the space we are in? we are in the space of probability distributions on R. So that's the real numbers. That's what that symbol is supposed to be. So imagine this circle I've drawn, even though it's two dimensional on the screen, you know, it's infinite dimensional in real life. And this is just the space of all probability distributions on R. Every single one, even the most complicated wacky ones. Okay, so theta is a parametric distribution. Um, and so just like um, if you draw a line, on a 2D sheet of paper, you know, that's a one manifold and two, theta is finite dimensional. And if I try to draw it inside an infinite dimensional space, it's going to look like something like, you know, a sub manifold. And so I'll draw theta, let's say this is theta within PR. This is the space it pervades. And what does misspecification look like? It looks like P is off the manifold described by theta. Okay. And so how would you normally go about fitting a model like this? Well, you would just sort of pick the closest point. You know, this would be theta star or something like that. And you'd say, well, this is an a a close enough descriptor of P and, um, you know, and then we'll go forward. So, you know, this, this is 
Um, and that, of course, suffers from all the problems of the sophistication as before. So let me give our proposed solution. And this is the key idea. OK. And I'll do this in two steps. Step one, robust density estimation. Estimation. Oh, geez. OK. Estimation. OK. I'm going to take a big pi as a prior for p on um, pr, then just be beige. And if you know pi is robust and tractable. Then we're done. Okay, what do I mean by this? So, um, what do I mean by pi is robust? Well, I mean that it has full support. Um, that is, you know, any probability distribution in PR is with can be described has like positive density under the prior pi. And I haven't solved the problem. I sort of just moved the infinity from you know the question to the prior. But just bear with me for a second because the point is, even if we had this prior right now, that wouldn't solve the problem. Um, well, any, it can't be any any density, right? Even with the Gaussian processes, you have some smoothness assumptions, right? Don't don't you? So there's regularity, I think. Um, yes. Okay. Well, uh, well, you can actually have um, you can have densities which are you can have a prior which is consistent for any density, and I'll actually. Um, oh, you can. Oh, all you right. Can. Cool. Yes, the polya tree. Um, well, oh, okay. Cool. Well, that, that's a spoiler, but okay. Okay. <laughs> that's the next slide. Uh huh. But um, okay, let's say you even had that. Um, that wouldn't solve the problem. Uh, the reason is most of PR is insane, right? It's totally unhinged. Um, and um, the prior you specify is going to give you really weird results because there's no way you know you expect P to be some incredibly oblique, you know, devil staircase, no dent, like you know, some probability distribution that can't be described by a density, right? And um, there's manifold um, statistical pathologies associated with such priors, including even um, a small change in the prior can have unbounded changes in your final result. And that's called Bayesian fragility, if you're interested. But the point is that this doesn't solve the problem. We have to be a bit smarter about choosing our prior. And the point is that we have to pick, you know, the prior has to be centered at distributions that are reasonable. Um, and how do we pick distributions that are reasonable? Well, we bring in our big data, right? So um, what we're going to do is we're going to learn pi using um, empirical Bayes, EB. It's going to have two parameters. It's going to have a center, theta. And it's going to have a relaxation. H. OK, what do I mean by the center and relaxation? Let me just draw this in cartoon form. So um, let's say I have my pi and it has center theta star and relaxation h. What does that look like? Well, I hope it'll look like something like this. Um, I'll draw the contours of the distribution. It'll, it should be centered around theta star. And it should look like something like this, right? Um, where this, uh, I drew this really asymmetrically, but this should be symmetric. Um, this uh, distance, you know, this relaxation is h. Okay, so what I've done here is mediate between the parametric and the non-parametric. On the one hand, um, from the parametric side, I've sort of relaxed um, by h away from a point estimate, right? So if h were to be zero, then we would get back to our parametric case. All the the prior would just be exactly theta star. And we would go on doing our analysis just by um, a point estimate of the parameter. Um, as h goes to infinity, pi becomes sort of smooth on all of PR. And we're back to the non-parametric case, where we have all those problems of Bayesian fragility and all these other things um, that I talked about before. And so by picking an intermediate h, we hope to get the best world, best of you know, the parametric inference and also the um, robustness and flexibility of the non-parametric inference. Okay. 
So this all hinges on a, you know, a way to actually specify pi that is um, robust, tractable, and can be described in terms of these two parameters. And so that's what I'll be developing in the next few slides. OK. And such a distribution is called a polyetry. OK, so I'm going to develop this. Um, I'm going to develop a polyetry. And to do so, I'll first start by um, sampling from the normal distribution in a very awkward way. OK. Sampling from n0, 1. OK. Let me draw the real line. This is 0 right here. Let me call everything below 0 this set, b0, everything above 0, this set, b1. And what you're going to do is you're going to flip a coin. Um, we're going to call p0. 50% you go to the left. And p1, 50% you go to the right. OK, let's say you flip your first coin. And by coin, I mean, you know, one side of the coin, I guess, is labeled 0, and the other side is 1. And let's say you get 0. So what that means is that your data point is going to be below 0. OK, then you're going to flip another coin. You're going to divide up b0 in terms of the quantiles of the normal distribution. So this is going to be b0, 0. And this side is going to be b0, 1. And right here is you're going to, ha you're going to have your uh, first quantile of the normal distribution. And you're going to flip another coin, p0, 0, 0 equals 50%. You end up going to the first, you go um, to the left um, of this demarcation, and p0, 1, 50%, you go to the right. And then you just continue. Let's say we get um, a heads this time, or one, I guess. Then what you're going to do is you're going to do the same thing, but with the octiles, um, I guess this would be the third octile, right, of the um, normal distribution. And you would have you know, your b0, 1, 0, b0, 1, 1. And you'd have your p0, 1, 0, and p0, 1, 1, and p, those p's are going to be 50%, right? And if you just keep going, right, what you're doing when you when you continuously flip coins is you're determining um, the the um, location of the, your drop from the normal distribution to increasing resolution, right? First, you determine which whether it's positive or negative, and then you determine which quantile it's in, and then you determine which octile it's in, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, and um, to go from the polyetry, go to the polyetry now. It's actually very simple. Um, polyetry. So this is the same thing as 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 sampling a uniform zero one random variable by uh, by tossing a coin for its um, for its binary expansion exactly, and exactly. then mapping that to the real line using the normal quantile function yes the inverse yes, yes, cumulative yes, yes. distribution exactly hundred percent perfect okay polyetry so in the normal case um, you know p epsilon let's say for every um, Partition epsilon is equal to one half. For the polyetry, tree, we just sample p epsilon zero, p epsilon one, and epsilon can be you know zero one zero one one or you know whatever any sort of like um, you know uh, level of the partition um, and particular bin, and we're going to sample this from a beta distribution. And the coefficients of the beta are going to be alpha epsilon zero and alpha epsilon 1. You know, what are the important things I have to say here? OK. Yes, OK. First of all, um, even though we, we're no longer um, you know, sampling from a Gaussian, we're going to stick with the Gaussian, um, Gaussian partition um, into quantiles and octiles. Actually, we'll see that it doesn't really matter um, for the flexibility. Um, the second point is that hopefully you'll just take my word for it, but like I, I think if you think about it for a second, this is somewhat intuitive. Any sort, just by changing what, just by changing the values of p, you can sample any distribution from the polyetry. tree. Um, so just by modifying the p to, um, you know, uh, let's say if you want to sample a plus, p 
P0 um, would be 50%, P1 would be 50%, just because the Laplace is symmetric. But then the quantile, to go to the quantiles, you know, you just uh, sort of uh, pick the P's to match the Laplace's density within those quantiles. And so by picking particular P's, you can pick any distribution of the real numbers. And so in this sense, the Polya tree is um, expressing um, any distribution can be drawn. So how are you using the subscript epsilon? I just didn't follow that. Yeah, so epsilon is a level of the partition. So, um, so is, it, here, is, it, is, it, is it like a half and then a quarter and then a, and so on? Uh, so over here, epsilon is, you know, zero, one, one. And over here, you know, epsilon. Is oh, it's the sequence. Got yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I see. So you, so for each like little finite binary string, you have a, a, a thing, mm -hmm. uh, a, a P, a P, so, or sorry, a, a, an alpha. You have an alpha. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. by, and by modulating those alphas, you can make this express anything. The, by modulating the P's, right? And so. By modulating. The P's, yeah, exactly. So oh, the alphas are the like point, the prior. The alphas are the priors on the p's, and by modulating yeah. the p's, you can express anything. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Just trying to follow. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and the question you asked before about um, you know this, this sort of um, uh, consistency. If you pick the alphas in a particular way, people have proved that you can actually be consistent to any real distribution. So you can learn that using this prior. Um, so here's our framing. So and the, the role of the normal zero one is now just that it's it's some it's just absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue on the line like it's just any any density on the line will do right so, yeah exactly exactly okay um, here's our framing yeah exactly okay so I'll show later on that this is tractable and I'll also show some draws from it and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what I said is that I wanted to center the polya tree at a particular distribution, and I also wanted to have this like idea of relaxation. So um, our alpha, the way we pick our alpha epsilons will have a um, particular form. Um, so this is sort of like diverting away from the general polya tree. It'll have three parts. The first is epsilon squared. So in this case, epsilon, when epsilon is you know, here, I would say the, this is just the length of epsilon. Is equal to three, and so that's just the level. And um, why do I add this? This is for smoothing. Um, what do I mean by that? I'll get to that in a few slides, but um, just know that this isn't the most important part of the um, expression. It's these next two parts. The first is one over h, and this is supposed to be the concentration. Um, okay, and so intuitively, the beta has variance. Proportional, uh, approximately proportional, I should say, to one over alpha, which is, you know, by our framing, approximately proportional to h, right? And so the higher h is, the more, the higher the variance of this polya tree is. And so this matches the intuition of like, you know, the spread of the prior. The second part is the bias, and that's going to be an f epsilon. I'm going to call this the bias. And this is going to be represent a bias just because I'm going to impose the condition that f epsilon zero plus f epsilon one is equal to one. And so the mean of the beta um, is proportional to, is going to be end up being proportional to f epsilon one. And so um, by modulating the f, f epsilon, you can modulate the center of the Polya tree. And by modulating the h, you can modulate the variance of the Polya tree. Okay. So I'm going to show you draws from the polya tree. Okay, and so how do you draw from the polya tree? Well, for every epsilon, you just draw these p epsilon, and then you just plot the histogram of you know what that looks like. And so let me show so, you. So some, f yeah. f is the thing. F corresponds to if if you take h, if you if you take the concentration to infinity, then then f parameterizes the center as a distribution using the polya tree. Is that right? Exactly. Uh -huh, okay. uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, as, as H goes down to zero, you know, the beta becomes incredibly concentrated just around, you know, this F. Um, that's all right. Perfect. Um, okay, so here are our draws from a polya tree. So here's what that looks like. So once again, the partition is picked from a standard Gaussian. Um, here I picked H equals one fifth, and I picked F 
um, just as one half. And so, you know, we're centered at the Gaussian and this is what it looks like, right? So some draws, you can get like distributions that are um, not centered at the Gaussian, but like, you know, have some perturbation. And the truly fantastic thing about the Poynier tree is that these distributions can be described in terms of a density, right? Not every distribution in on the real line can, has a density, but every single distribution with probability one from the Poynier tree does. And so that's fantastic um, that we're drawing reasonable distributions. Okay, so the next slide is supposed to describe- um, Alan, um, a, a, yes. a quick question. So to parameterize a Poynier tree, do you need to specify the number of <clears throat> Um, levels prior, or is it like infinite for like any instance of a Poynier tree? Great, yeah, it is infinite. Um, but you know, on my computer, I mean, well, on a computer, obviously, there's a finite um, precision, but also there's an even more finite precision when, like, you know, you're you're viewing this on a screen. So you can actually see some of these boxes are some of these um, boxes on the histogram are like one pixel large, and that's just that's the level I went to when drawing from this Poynier tree. I didn't, yeah. Right, but so you don't, so how do you set this? So you have F epsilon. Mm -hmm. um, and so do you have to pick like an infinite number of F epsilons, F epsilons for each level or like how are those, how are the, like, cause these are the hyperparameters like of your distribution of your parameter, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so how do you pick those? Um, sorry, the, I, I'm not sure I understand. Um, so H and F, like, are those, like, are those hyperparameters that you need to pick, or are they described like by the distribution that you're try trying to fit, or like your data? Yeah. So they're the hyperparameters that I pick, and so these the hyper these are just the parameters of the Poynier tree distribution. And the Poynier tree is a distribution on the space of distributions. F describes the center, and then H describes sort of the variance. If oh, I see. So you, you have a single F epsilon and a single H. You don't have Oh, like... oh that's a, OK. I see what you mean. Yes. OK, so for all the epsilons, yeah. So there is a single H. And yeah, you're right. F epsilon, there's infinitely many. Um, that's correct. Uh, yeah, so on the first level, there's two. And on the second level, there's four, and so on and so forth. Here, I just set them all to 1 half, right? And that's okay. um, every single one to 1 half. Uh, and that's just because uh, that's that's the um, what you need to set it to to center at the gas. And right. I'll show you um, uh, alternate settings uh, later on. Um, so 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 um, these are really if you go all the way to infinity, they're really densities. They're not singular continuous. They're, yep. And I'll show you what uh, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. They, they look pretty spiky. Anyway, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I I swear they're densities. Actually, I have an okay. expression for the. Uh, you can you can calculate the density. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Um, I have a, I, I am afraid a very basic question, probably uh -huh. I, I misunderstood something here. That is, uh, so the problem is that we are trying to estimate the density, if I understand. Yeah. And this procedure requires us to know the quantiles of this density that still we don't know. Isn't that a circular procedure? Um, I just, um, so when I'm defining the Poynier tree, I always use the quantiles of a Gaussian. That's just, uh, and you could use the quantiles of anything. Um, that's not to, um, you don't need to fit the quantiles to the distribution you need. You can just pick them a priori to be whatever you want. And in this case, I just picked the Gaussian because that's um, me. Okay, thank you. Great, okay, so, now I told you the intuitive explanation of what H and F are, so let me justify that. Okay, so let me just remind you of the role of the H and the F. Um, so the H is the variance and F is the bias. So over here, I picked a quite a small H um, and quite a, and um, an F to center it at a Gaussian. Um, and so you can see that um, the draws from the Poynier tree are pretty close to a Gaussian and um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. When I raise H, I increase the variance and I start to draw things that are still centered at the Gaussian, but I get like really wacky distributions. And these are still, these are still described by densities, yes. Um, although the densities are not um, continuous. I guess that's the... Um, now, I can also change F epsilon um, uh, to draw from A Laplace. And so you can see that here. Um, and that's just by changing the F epsilon, the H sticks to one over 30, um, you can control where the Poynier tree is centered. Okay, 
So that's the intuition between H and F epsilon. OK, and um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, you know, I, I promised that this was for the smoothing. And um, the point is that uh, you know, the alpha, these coefficients alpha, have to increase with epsilon just to make sure these, you actually get densities. And indeed, actually, if you, if you set, if you have these F alphas decrease with epsilon quite quickly, then you do get an atomic distribution. You don't get densities. You actually get a Dirichlet process um, with a standard Gaussian base measure. So that's just for, I guess, the aficionados who are interested. Um, so these are atomic and don't have densities. So that's not such a trivial property. OK. This is quite a, um, uh, so now I'm just basically going to say uh, everything is tractable under the Dirichlet prime. So marginal likelihoods, you can calculate it pretty easily. Um, you just uh, take the product under a Dirichlet multinomial, and you can just implement a Dirichlet multinomial. That's like, you know, sapphire.stats Dirichlet multinomial for, um, and you just look at uh, how many times um, your data um, ended up in each uh, histogram. And since the alphas increase, um, this eventually goes to one. And so you can uh, approximate this density pretty well just by going to a finite um, level of epsilon. The posterior is also really, really easy to uh, calculate. Um, simply just change, just add, um, yeah, so for uh, just add one to alpha epsilon for every uh, data point that goes into um, the bin epsilon. So that's also really easy to calculate. And then finally, here's our goal. Um, density prediction, right? That's the posterior predictive. What is the posterior predictive? It is um, the expectation under the polya tree, um, given the data, xi1 up to xn, of the density. Um, and uh, you can calculate the posterior predictive. It's simply, um, you just use this. The alpha prime is supposed to, um, uh, represent the fact that we've changed these alphas using this formula um, to represent the data. And um, you, know, you can see it just modulates this Gaussian density. And OK, so what does that look like? Uh, um, when h is equal to 1, um, your variance is quite small. And so you know, you're quite centered at the Gaussian. And um, you modulate a little to um, you modulate your, plus your predictive, your density estimate a little to um, match the data. Um, when h is quite large, your variance is very large, and you trust the data a lot more. And so you can see, um, you know, the prior predictive, which is the blue curve, um, changes in both cases to um, with respect to the data, which is the red dot, much more um, when the variance is a lot larger. Um, OK, and so that gets to our inclusion. We've essentially solved non-parametric density estimation. Um, you know, we have a robust thing. We can use, we can center it at any reasonable or simple uh, model, um, and so I'll just refer to PT, beta star H, um, you know, as just a Poyer tree with parameter H with F epsilon picked to center at P theta star, and that um, essentially solves that. Um, so you've thing. used one guy in your original expertly designed family, but you, mm -hmm. but but like you haven't used the whole family, and how did you pick the guy? OK, yes. Um, let me go back to that. Um, I haven't used the whole thing. I sort of use the whole family because I pick the guy using empirical base. Um, so I can get. Um, you and remember, how does uh, that how, how does that did, did you sorry if you already described that? Mm -hmm. How does that part go? Um, OK, yeah, so I didn't describe I didn't describe that part. So how uh, usually how you do empirical base is, you know, you you calculate um, the marginal likelihood under the prior um, and I see I see yeah. of the data of the okay so, the so you do that you, do, you use empirical base to pick your theta from your family and then you use theta as the center that's that's how you do it exactly and so you I use see. this guy to, you optimize this right. and so this becomes your objective yep okay 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 Fine. and then you update your density estimation using this yeah okay okay, okay great um, so Eli will give virtually the same story when he talks about sequences in the next um, talk. OK, um, I'd like to have time for questions. So I'll go through this next part a little bit um, quickly. So basically, this, the next two parts are um, we have this fantastic 
um, idea and like paradigm for non-parametric density estimation. What else can we do with it? And the other things we can do with it are testing. Um, so I asked from the beginning, how do you measure misspecification in such a way that you can actually, you know, confirm that you aren't misspecified or, um, or reject that hypothesis? Um, well, you can use a Polya tree. So here's the goodness, here's the framing of the goodness of fit test. How likely is it that my distribution in my model class of interest produced my data? Okay. Here's your null hypothesis that the data actually came from a p theta. Let's say with um, you know you you picked a theta star. That's your best guess at where the data came from. Alternatively, your data came from some p that is not in the model class. Um, so this is the difficulty, right? That I pointed out. What does it even mean to come up? Like, what does it mean for p not to be in your model class, right? There's a whole bunch of other. There's a lot in the rest of distribution space, right? So a good way to uh, build this goodness of the test is to simply compare the likelihood of the data under your MLE and under a relaxed polya tree with a fixed H. Fixed H. And this is supposed to represent the probability of the null model um, with respect to, uh, uh, quotiented with the probability of the um, alternative hypothesis. And um, yeah, and where poly Polio tree, just a reminder, has this um, thing. And so actually, this is this is uh, where polio trees find their most important use to perform this exact goodness of fit test. The scheme they use um, in this paper is a little bit more complicated. They use mixtures of polio trees to like, actually, as you pointed out, yeah, I'm only looking at a single point. They use the whole um, parameter space, but the idea still holds. Um, so this is just supposed to like give you an idea of like how the base factor here, um, the comparison of the ideal point, the theta star, with the relaxed um, posterior changes um, with h. So when h is very small, the polya tree is centered exactly at theta star, and so um, you know the the polya tree prior is pretty much exactly just a, a point at p theta star. And so you don't expect these two probability distributions to be very different. And so the base factor is pretty much zero, uh, the log base factor, I mean. When h is very large, actually, your um, MLE does better than the polya tree. And that's because of, you know, I talked about um, the stuff in the polya tree starts like pulling models that are crazy, right? And that's what I said um, when I talked about, you know, you don't want a non-parametric prior on the entire space because you're going to get a bunch of unreasonable things. And so, you know, this is why you want to include your parametric model in your inference. Um, but then there's also this mediation. Um, there's an optimal H uh, around which um, the uh, likelihood is maximized. And so this is, uh, you know, what you would get from empirical Bayes. Uh, this is the H you would learn from that you would fit. OK, um, and then the last, this is the last slide. Um, one, one last thing you can do is just two sample testing. Um, you know, how likely is it that data XI and data YI came from the same distribution? Let's say you have two histograms of data and you're like, are they, do they come from the same place or not, right? Um, and you want a probability. So in this case, um, why is this important in the space of sequences? Um, let's say you fit your generative model of sequences and you generate some sequences, generated some sequences from your generative model. You want to know whether they're realistic or not. Um, and so currently, how people do this in the field is they just pick some statistics like, um, you know, length or hydrophobicity or something like that, and then just um, compare the histograms of the draws of those statistics. But um, a common, you know, criticism of this technique is that, you know, agreement of these statistics, such as length and hydrophobicity and correlation, doesn't necessarily mean that the sequences are viable and realistic, right? And so if you, if we can develop a two parameter, two sample test, that doesn't make use of any statistics. You can discriminate between, uh, can tell you whether two sequences, uh, two sets of sequences came from the same distribution, just not parametrically. You know, that'd be quite the um, development. Just simply, you know, uh, here's the framing. Um, your null hypothesis is that these two sets, uh, distribution, two sets of data came from the same distribution, and your alternative is that they came from diff different distributions. And then, um, basically, the solution is, you know, you just taking a non-parametric prior, and that non-parametric prior is just going to be some polio tree you fit. Uh, and that's the, that's the um, cash line, I guess. Um, the point is that this is what people do. In fact, they use polio trees to develop two sample tests in this exact way. 
Okay. So that's the end of my primer. Um, stick around for Eli's um, talk next. The point um, I wanted to get across was that uh, polyutrase can be used for these, um, to develop these tests, two sample and good as a fit to measure misspecification and to like whether two sets of data came from the same place. And on the other hand, you know, the most important po point of the talk was that you can embed parametric models into non-parametric models. And you can, with this idea of this relaxation parameter H, and um, on the one hand, you get um, improved robust density estimation, but you also, um, on the other hand, you get interpretable models. And so, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Today, I'll be talking about um, uh, uh, building and evaluating um, uh, uh, probabilistic uh, uh, generative models um, of biological sequences. And, and I'll take you um, uh, uh, through two projects going from the, going from the protein um, up to the to the whole genome um, scale. Uh, so I, I want to start with some 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 really uh, general motivation. Um, measuring and and making sequences is really fundamental um, to all aspects of modern um, biology and biomedicine. And it it doesn't really matter um, what field you're in. Um, uh, you're interested in in. Uh, looking at sequences and in, in analyzing sequences and, and very often in, in making new sequences, um, whether it's to test their properties or, or to develop um, new technologies. Um, this talk is going to be about uh, uh, taking us from, from measuring to making. So, so using um, um, probabilistic machine learning to, to analyze the sequences that we measure and then to design new sequences that we can um, uh, make, uh, uh, synthesize or edit in the lab. Um, uh, so, so what exactly do I mean by this? Well, well uh, uh, by understanding sequence data, I mean understand it um, statistically, and, and in particular, we want to be able to predict sequences. We want to be able to actually um, make some predictions about what sequences we haven't seen or might occur in the future. Along the way, we want to be able to extract interpretable patterns, and, and ultimately, we, you know, we want to be able to use um, uh, 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 models to form and evaluate causal theories to understand what um, uh, impacts uh, uh, sequences. Um, uh, if we do a good enough job, we should ultimately be able not only um, uh, to say something uh, mathematically, but, but uh, uh, to actually generate new sequences. So, so we should be able to actually um, uh, synthesize and edit new sequences and then that'll give us an opportunity to test the predictions of these models in the lab or, or to design um, uh, new technologies. Uh, so, so probabilistic machine learning is a powerful framework for doing both the understanding and the generating part. Um, uh, you write down some model and, and in this talk, the, the model will describe um, uh, some distribution over sequences. Um, and you can examine um, posteriors or posterior predictives in, in order to understand uh, that sequence data. And then uh, uh, if the model's tractable, you can generate new sequences. So you can draw samples um, uh, from a posterior predictive distribution. And then those uh, uh, can be sent off um, uh, uh, you know, to twist or whatever to, to, to be made and, and tested in the lab. Um, and it, Hopefully that, that sounds sort of normal and you know, obviously uh, uh, it's nothing new to be doing Bayesian statistics on, on scientific data, um, but I wanna emphasize that it's really not um, how uh, most sequence analysis today, uh, even decades after people started doing this, um, still gets done. Uh, so, so, so the sort of average workflow, um, uh, I think of, a, of an average computational biologist working with um, working with sequence data is, you know, you start with sequences in the form of, of evolutionary sequences or, or raw read data, and, and then you're going to push it through some pipeline. That pipeline will involve things like alignment and assembly. It'll involve calling variants. It'll involve some form of annotation often. And then ultimately, you're, you're going to really try and predict something else. So, so in GWAS, of course, you're going to try and predict some phenotype, uh, uh, in in um, uh, uh, when you're working with evolutionary sequences, sometimes you want to know structure, and, and there's an infinite list of things, you know, epigenetic marks or or whatever it is. Um, and so so the real point of generative probabilistic modeling um, here is to try and be able to also go the other way, right? So we want to we want to turn the ship around. We want to be able to go 
um, uh, uh, not only from sequences to a covariate or to features, we want to be able to go from features back um, to sequences. We want to be able to predict sequences based on um, uh, those features and covariates. Um, so, so here's uh, just an example um, uh, that you heard about recently from the lab where you know you take a, 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 a June um, and uh, Adam and uh, Aaron uh, took sequences um, measured from uh, llama and nanobodies um, and they built probabilistic models to both um, understand um, the fitness of these uh, 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 sequences and to generate um, new uh, functional sequences that they then made and tested in the lab. Um, but really, this is kind of just uh, the beginning, right? Uh, uh, if you start to think about all the ways in which sequence data uh, is used. And, and there's lots and lots of questions that can be framed as sequence prediction questions. So, you know, we want to know what future pathogen sequences, what future virus genomes are going to emerge. Um, we want to be able to predict unobserved sequences. So, you know, maybe we've found a bunch of enzymes in, in uh, measuring uh, uh, microbiome data. Um, what other variants might be out there? Um, and we want to understand causal impacts in, in real life situations. You know, how, how, is, how is a particular cancer treatment going to impact genomes in, in, in tumor cells? Um, and if we're successful, we should be able to give precise enough answers um, to actually be able to go in and generate um, uh, uh, sequences based on those predictions. Okay, so, so to, to sort of frame the problems that are involved um, in, in developing these models, a, a, a useful conceptual device um, uh, is something called uh, Box's Loop. And it basically says that probabilistic modeling uh, comes down to doing three things um, it, uh, in a loop. Uh, first, you will need to be able to design models um, effectively. Uh, second, you need to be able to infer models at, at scale. And third, you need to be able to critique models. You need to know when they're doing well and, and, and when they're not. Um, and so what this talk is, is about is, is really um, uh, all three stages of this process and, and identifying some of the key bottlenecks that are um, limiting the application of, of uh, generative probabilistic sequence models across um, uh, 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 application domains. Um, and the kind of brief answer, the, the one sentence summary, is that there's a ton of tools that are available for other types of data, like for instance, this polya tree for 1D continuous data that you heard about in the primer, um, that we don't have any sort of analog for when it comes to um, uh, sequence data. So uh, uh, we're kind of working with our uh, uh, hands tied behind our back. We're missing um, key tools that statisticians use all the time for other types of data. Um, so, uh, I'll tell two stories um, in this talk. Um, uh, these are two different ways of, of iterating through um, uh, Box's loop. Um, the first one uh, uh, is something we call a MUE distribution. This is a, a tool for building generative um, uh, protein models out of arbitrary um, continuous vector models. And the second, I'll, I'll deal with uh, some of the issues that you heard about in the primer, and I'll talk about bare models, which are a tool for building non-parametric um, models as well as hypothesis tests. Um, and these can reach beyond the protein, individual protein scale into the, the whole genome scale. OK, so, so this first project, um, uh, uh, obviously, is my advisor, uh, uh, Deborah Marks. Um, and it's uh, motivated uh, uh, by um, uh, some of the issues that uh, come up all the time um, when you try and go and build uh, uh, a model for sequences. So uh, we want to think about sequences as just any other sort of data. And you know, if you want to predict sequences and you have some covariates, you might want to use something like a linear regression model. Um, if you think there's some nonlinearities involved, you might want a Gaussian process. Maybe you think that sequences um, vary according, have some underlying features that explain um, uh, sequence variations. You want to build some kind of factor model principal component analysis. Or you think there's more something more complex going on. Maybe you think that there's uh, 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 some differential equation, or you think that there's some uh, complicated uh, convolutional neural network might, might explain um, uh, these sequences. So all these models that I've just mentioned are, are I think, fundamental to how people think about um, uh, statistics, but they're all 
continuous vector models. Um, they all describe vectors in continuous space. Um, and that's for a reason, right? These are mathematically tractable objects. Um, and so what this uh, story is gonna be about is how to connect these, these vector space models to um, sequence space um, and deal with the fact that sequences uh, uh, live in a different space. They're variable length, they're discrete. Um, and they have a different notion of distance. We have different intuition about what kinds of sequences are, are close or similar to, to other kinds of sequences. Okay, and so I wanna start with, with the, the conventional approach to, to solving this problem. So, so let's say you wanna do a linear regression, you wanna build your Gaussian process model. How might someone uh, right now in the field tell you to go about applying it to um, your sequence data? Um, well, uh, there's a very good chance that the, what they would tell you is to uh, start by running a multiple sequence alignment. Um, so multiple sequence alignment, you take your sequence data, you pass it through this complicated nonlinear function, uh, an alignment algorithm, um, and you're going to get out a matrix um, uh, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of your data. Um, and the idea, you know, if all goes according to plan, then, then um, positions in the sequences that are um, uh, conserved um, are going to all line up in the same column. And that's going to make it much easier to build uh, a generative uh, uh, or any sort of probabilistic model because there's low variance in these columns. Um, so uh, this is a convenient approach, but it turns out to have really uh, serious problems, um, which we're going to talk about uh, um, in depth, but um, boil down to basically the fact that if you pre-process your, your data like this, um, the models that you build to describe it um, that try and predict sequences aren't really predicting sequences. They're predicting um, aligned sequences. Um, and there's a problem because multiple sequence alignment is, is unreliable. And in particular, as you add more data, um, the multiple sequence alignment, including its dimension, um, can change. So, the so if the overall amount of polymorphism is, is really low, then, then it is kind of reasonable. Would you agree with that? And then if there's sort of a lot of polymorphism or in particular, a lot of structural variation, then it becomes unreasonable? Um, I think or that's is it, not- I, Is that not quite right? Yeah, I think there are worse, even very, very small amounts of variation can cause serious issues. So if you really, really believe that there's absolutely no chance of indels, um, yeah, I can't argue with it, but uh, I'll talk about why the problems I are see. actually- so, so intuitively, I think a lot of people, you know, right, are familiar with the issue of multiple sequence alignment. And it's not reliable. It doesn't work when there's structural variance. Um, the issues that I'm going to talk about are, are uh, cut a little deeper. Um, I see. Okay. There may be a kind of piling up of these small problems can become really big problems. Yeah, you'll see in a moment. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So, so before getting into the details of what those problems are, I briefly want to say what our solution is. So what is all our alternative? Um, so, so basically, we propose um, uh, uh, a new model that's going to reverse that pre-processing and, and, and do it in, instead um, uh, construct a generative model. So, right, so we start with um, a model that you might apply to um, uh, uh, aligned data. So this can be any continuous vector space um, model. And then uh, instead of applying it to MSA pre-processed data, um, you're gonna slap something called a MUE on it. And when you attach a MUE to it, um, you use a MUE as, as an output distribution, um, uh, you'll generate unaligned sequences, but crucially you'll retain the key intuition behind um, alignment. So you're gonna still retain the idea of an alignment. You'll still be able to talk about variation at conserved sites, you'll still be able to talk about your model in the language that biologists are used to talking about um, um, sequences in terms of indels and, and conserved sites and so on. And so the, the category of thing this is, um, it is, a, is a structured output distribution or a structured observation distribution or an emission distribution or an error distribution. It goes under lots of different names, but the basic idea is that it's a, a technique for taking continuous vector models to um, uh, uh, some other data space. Um, and so you can should think of this as analogous to, um, you know, if you're building models of uh, RNA-seq data, 
um, and you want to build a regression model, um, you can use a negative binomial output and it'll give you counts. Um, or if you're working in neuroscience and you have some time series model, you can use a Poisson um, to give you um, spikes. So uh, the MUE is intended as a structured um, observation distribution for sequences. And our hope is that it can, can um, uh, be just as ubiquitous. So, so in the same way that, that combining uh, a, a negative binomial um, with your model of choice is an easy recipe in RNA-seq, and you can use it to develop new um, uh, VAEs uh, or whatever it is, um, combining UE with your favorite continuous vector model is a recipe for building um, biological sequence models. Um, so here's uh, just briefly a case study of that recipe in action. Um, so uh, I'll go into this in more depth in a little bit, but um, uh, you know, practically, let's say you have some data set, it's really complicated, it's a bunch of T cell receptors. Um, uh, you can basically treat it as you would any continuous vector data. So for instance, if you're used to taking your data and running um, PCA and then running a TSNE to visualize it, you can do just the same thing. Here's a TSNE visualization of a TCR data set, and I've overlaid it with colors of showing a supervised annotation. And you can see that um, uh, they cluster according to that supervised annotation. Um, if you are interested in the factors that explain um, sequence variation, you can, in fact, um, uh, just look at the um, principal components. And finally, because it's all part of this generative framework, um, you can do sequence prediction um, as well. Um, so a, a shorthand, if, especially if you're not um, uh, familiar with, with uh, the whole world of um, uh, uh, generative uh, probabilistic modeling, is that a lot of the um, techniques and um, ideas that have been so successful in in, uh, for instance, um, single cell uh, RNA-seq analysis and that we've seen a lot of in MIA talks in the past, you can kind of convert um, directly uh, uh, into sequence analysis and, and do something similar. Okay, so, so here's kind of my outline for, for the rest of this part of the talk. Um, so I'll, I'll first go into some depth on, on why MSA pre-wrestling is a problem. I'll then introduce what the MUE distribution actually is, and I'll describe how you do inference um, at large scale in models that use um, UE distributions, um, and then I'll go through some results. Okay, so, so why is MSA preprocessing um, such a problem? Um, the reason uh, is that basically, um, as you observe more data, the preprocessed data changes. Um, so if you observe three sequences, let's say, you might construct a multiple sequence alignment and you see it has um, five columns. If you see another fourth um, sequence that's longer, inevitably your multiple sequence alignment will grow and it'll grow not just um, um, in height, but in width. Um, at the same time, previous data will start to rearrange. You'll have to introduce gaps um, or you'll adjust um, the positioning of those gaps. Um, and this is a real uh, thing that happens um, uh, in actual important data sets. So, so here's an uh, uh, admittedly somewhat extreme example um, in the case of immune um, receptors, but here we see a 10x growth in the dimension of this pre-processed data as we go from 10 data points to, to 10,000. Okay, so, so the issue with this is not so, not simply the fact that MSAs are unreliable or we might not trust them. Um, the issue uh, actually has to do um, with model criticism. So uh, I mentioned this earlier in the context of Box's loop. Um, and so what I want you to think about is let's imagine you've built um, your uh, multiple sequence alignment based model. So what you did was you pre-processed your data you created a multiple sequence alignment, and then you built your model. It's a fixed continuous vector space model. Um, and the, uh, uh, when you do so, your model will have the dimension of the, the training data. Um, and then you'll try and make some predictions, right? Uh, the trouble comes when you actually see some held out data, right? So, so when a held out data emerges, you see some new sequence. The MSA can change, the MSA will grow. And suddenly you're in this weird position where your model isn't even defined 
over the space that the data lives in. So what's going on fundamentally is that when you do MSA pre-processing, you're breaking some key assumptions, assumptions so basic to, to statistics that they're often um, ignored or, or unmentioned or, or just mentioned in passing. Um, and that is A, that the data lives in a particular space and your model lives in the same space. And B, that you observe data sequentially. And so once you see a data point, that data point is fixed. There's nothing that it can change. There's, there's no way it can change when you see more data. Using MSA pre processing puts you in this strange position where the data space is changing as you observe more data and the model will no longer be defined over the right space. And B, the data itself is changing. Past data is being altered as you add new sequences to the, to the alignment. And so uh, violating these assumptions is a serious problem because it breaks the, the theoretical justification for how we evaluate models and statistics. Um, we can't, can no longer construct held out likelihoods. Um, Bayes factors don't make sense. Prequential evaluation doesn't make sense. Um, uh, uh, all the things that uh, we rely on to do good statistics and to do safe and robust statistics um, um, start to break down. So, so that's really the issue. Um, and this problem uh, is widespread. It hasn't been widely uh, commented on for the reason that simply people don't try and use sequence models for prediction. But we live in the modern age where sequence evolution is on the nightly news. Um, we want to be able to do uh, sequence prediction. And so uh, even very standard phylogenetic models, things that people use ubiquitously, that, you know, thousands of scientists and thousands of papers um, rely on MSA preprocessing and build generative models of MSA aligned um, uh, data um, in the form of phylogenetic models. Um, uh, uh, most of what uh, the lab has done in the past um, until very recently um, has revolved around fitness models, which similarly rely on, on MSA um, pre-processing. And so uh, these models, if you go through all these papers, um, you'll of course note that they never actually use them to predict sequences themselves. It's all for parameter inference um, type problems um, where the data set is fixed. Um, and this is, this is a key part of the reason. This is, or, or this is why you can't trust um, uh, evaluation of, of um, these models on, on predictive problems. And so the point of the UE is really that it provides a widely applicable and, and, and drop-in solution in, in many cases um, uh, to this problem. Eli, this is a really cool explanation of the problem with MSA, um, so clear. I have a question though, a, a high level question about the way you're saying prediction. Yeah. When you say predict a sequence, I mean, intuitively the, the sequence space is just so combinatorially huge. Like what does it mean predict a sequence? Does it, does it mean just have like a good generative model over sequences that kind of helps us do inference about some other thing? Like what do, what do you mean sequence prediction? Yeah, so um, I guess you can think of it. So, so I mean, I literally mean, you know, uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, I guess mathematically, it's no different. It's just in a high dimensional space. Right. It just seems like it's so so high dimensional that practically speaking, like what like it, it sequences are needles in haystacks. So how do you how do you predict a thing there? Like what does it mean to predict a sequence? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to connect it to to, to biological into, or to like some intuition about a problem. Yeah. It, so, so this could be a long discussion, but I guess um, let's imagine, so, so I really like the, the pathogen um, forecasting case um, uh, as an example. So let's say you're, you're predicting, um, uh, uh, you care about what viral strains are gonna emerge in the future. So the way you might do an experiment today um, is if you're systematic, you might test every single um, uh, variant, right? Every single single amino acid substitution of a sequence. But then, of course, someone can come along and complain that actually, well, what about doubles? Or, or, or you know, what about um, if some doubles actually have higher probability than singles? Um, you know, so there's that really, perhaps you should frame it not as a systematically exploring a neighborhood of a sequence. You want to know the full um, space of possible outcomes. Um, and when you design an experiment, it might be more important 
to evaluate um, uh, higher probability sequences, it, or it might be more important to evaluate um, some of the doubles than, than some of the um, uh, singles. So I think the, the, the point is that if you have a predictive model, you can design, for, for instance, you can design libraries that give a better coverage of the space of a possible outcomes. And while they might not give you every possible sequence, perhaps if the phenotype is only a, 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 a relatively simple function of the sequence, if you at least have good support um, over uh, that sequence space, then you'll um, uh, uh, have better insight. Um, awesome, yeah. So, so that, smarter, that, yeah. smarter parameterized distributions over sequences are useful for many things. Yeah, sort of exactly. Thing. Yeah, so, so we have some work that will come out eventually talking about how to, um, uh, talking about uh, basically generating sequences and then testing them and framing that as a experimentally um, and trying to understand the error that comes if you uh, that comes in that process if you're assaying sequences um, mm -hmm. and what you can awesome. show is that basically uh, you know you can you can reframe all this stuff as a sort of loss minimizer type of thing and and you can say that like uh, if you have an accurate picture of the sequence distribution you also have an accurate picture of downstream assays and so that, that sort of thing can mm -hmm. in the math yeah learning them together thanks yeah. Eli okay thanks. yeah I hope that helps it's a little longer um absolutely help no no I'm glad I'm glad I asked those those a good answer thanks okay um okay I'll briefly go the through the the intuition of of mu e models and, and how they work um so the basic way you should think of them is is as a, a generative alternative to uh um uh, MSA pre-processing. So, so the idea is that we're going to add in through a generative process the same mutations that MSA algorithms are, are intended to, to filter out these substitutions and insertions and deletions. Um, and this idea uh, isn't new. Um, so it was pioneered by, by Felsenstein's group um, uh, in the early 90s. Um, uh, but we uh, wanted to, I guess, um, push through and, and update it for the modern um, uh, age of machine learning and, and explore um, uh, a large class of, of, sequen of, of models of this property that, that could be more flexible. Um, so uh, I don't have time to go through this uh, construction um, in elaborate detail, but the basic idea of the MUE is that it's going to be like other um, uh, uh, generative models with latent alignment, um, a discrete uh, HMM, um, but it's got some key restrictions in the form of block structure transition and emission matrices. So in particular, um, we're going to design an HMM that has a transition matrix and that transition matrix says block structure, these A11s and so on. Um, and those have some upper triangular constraints. Um, and so the, 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 uh, that's the, uh, I guess, high level overview of the math. Um, the, the, the idea is that um, mu -E models are going to use a regressor sequence this X, this kind of ancestral sequence, or, um, and then they're going to predict um, uh, uh, generated or mutated sequences of that um, X. Um, and the key is that in this construction in, in, in uh, models of this type, in, in UE models in general, um, uh, the latent space, latent state variable the, of the HMM, of the MUE, can be interpreted in terms of an alignment. So we can convert it can we can convert between this latent variable and this generative process and an alignment between the regressor sequence X and the output sequence Y. And if we have multiple output sequences Y, we can actually compile these um, uh, um, uh, latent alignment variables into a multiple sequence alignment. So would, it, would it slow you down too much to go back to the last slide and ask for a bit more intuition on the actual guts of the thing? Or is that, if, if, if yes, sure. then feel free to move on, but. Uh, no, yeah, I can, I can take a question, yeah. So, so I mean, like, what, what's, why, why blocks and triangles, and what, what, what is this trying to capture? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the easiest way to, um, well, let's see. So, uh, the, the X here is this, um, uh, uh, intuitively is the ancestral sequence. Literally, mathematically controls the the emission distribution of your HMM. So this is controlling what states, uh, controlling how the states generate observations. Um, 
this block structure, uh, this upper triangular structure is going to control how you move along that regressor sequence. So it says that as you um, uh, as you sample states, as you as you sample um, uh, a generated sequence, you're going to reference this x in a particular order, um, and that ordering constraint is what um, actually makes uh, this latent alignment variable into a biological alignment. So it ensures that, for instance, sequences, this upper triangular structure is basically ensuring that you can't get situations where sequences rearrange, where blocks, portions of the sequence um, come in a different order. Um, Interesting, okay. So if you, yeah. if you I'll talk about uh, this in a moment, but I can explain it here instead. The, uh, if you remove this block structure, um, and you kept this regressor sequence, you would actually recover some classic NLP models, um, uh, uh, like the IBM models, um, uh, where X is a sequence in a, a, a sentence in one language, and Y is a sentence in another. Um, and in biology, we want to. We it turns out it's important to get a biological alignment to impose this restriction. If we didn't have this restriction. We, we end up with um, these language-like models, which allow arbitrary rearrangements of sentences. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, no, that, that's a great high-level start. And then I'll look at your paper for more. Thanks. Um, OK, yeah. So, so the, the basic point is that there's some interpretation of these, um, uh, these models in terms of um, uh, uh, latent alignments. Um, OK, uh, so, so at a high level, the, the MUI generalizes um, um, previous models and methods, so we can rederive a lot of the classic tools of um, bioinformatics, tools that are used um, ubiquitously, um, uh, like the uh, profile HMM or, or conditional distributions of the pair HMM, as well as non-probabilistic alignment methods you might be familiar, like Needleman Wunsch, and, and these can be rederived in uh, uh, as estimators, as map estimators of these mu -E models. Um, and then, and, and this is sort of uh, uh, the key, uh, uh, one of the um, uh, things that separates this from other frameworks um, for thinking about alignment is that we actually show that this is um, uh, uh, comprehensive. So these, these constraints um, that I propose, these block upper triangular constraints aren't arbitrary. Um, in fact, they're necessary and sufficient in order for this latent alignment variable to function as a um, biological alignment. Um, and, and this can help us distinguish actually between um, uh, models that have been used in the biological literature in the past um, and uh, uh, language translation models. So, so the, the, the architecture of biological HMMs um, uh, actually uh, uh, isn't entirely arbitrary. There are some arbitrary choices that everyone has made um, when they uh, design these um, models, but in fact, uh, um, uh, some of these choices are not arbitrary, and the MUI helps us uh, distinguish. Okay, so so just to 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 uh, recap a little bit, um, uh, we started with some continuous vector model. We augmented it with the MUI um, structured output distribution, and now we need to do inference. Um, so we can actually integrate over this um, latent alignment variable. What that means in effect is that we're considering all possible alignments um, during uh, uh, inference. And we can do so quickly um, using some modern techniques. Um, it's also differentiable. And so all of that is just to say that we can get these things into the framework of probabilistic, um, of modern probabilistic programming. Um, uh, so we can do stochastic variational inference. We can do other methods that rely on um, access to gradients. When you say the alignment variable, what, yeah. what should I be thinking intuitively? What, what, is, what is that thing parametrizing? Yeah, so that thing is parametrizing the, the relationship between the regressor or ancestral sequence and the output or observed sequence. Ah. And so if you... You, you can go, if you have the regressor and the output, you can take the latent alignment variable and get a pairwise alignment. If you have a many outputs, so if you have a whole data set, you can take the collection of latent alignment variables and get an MSA of that data set. But because yes. we're being probabilistic, of course, it's a posterior over MSAs. So here the MSA is, as it should be, something to be inferred 
not something that that comes in, in the pre-processing and and the posterior of these w's corresponds um, via this transformation that's uh, a little bit annoying but not too complicated um, to uh, 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 an MSO. Thanks. Yeah. Right. So um, uh, yeah. So so the yeah exactly. Um, okay. Right. So so mu e models, mu e output models can be can be used um, uh, uh, or are compatible with with modern probabilistic programming systems. And and here I want to give a really um, big shout out to the Broad um, Pyro team. Um, and, and especially uh, uh, Fritz and Eli, uh, who helped me integrate um, uh, MUI models to become available as part of the um, uh, Pyro uh, package now. So there's a QR code here, and, and I'll give some links at the end to that. Okay, just in, in a couple minutes, I want to go through um, uh, uh, what you can do with these models. Um, so we started by surveying um, a variety of data sets, evolutionary families, and, and immune receptors. Um, and we developed uh, 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 a few different UE models. So um, a profile HMM can be thought of as a constant plus a MUE output. We also developed a probabilistic PCA model plus a MUE output and, uh, and a VAE model plus a MUE output. And, and we can see um, substantial gains um, in perplexity. Um, uh, we then dived uh, in a little bit more detail into um, uh, some immune receptor um, data sets. Um, so these are uh, uh, sequencing experiments done on patients um, to collect um, uh, T cell and, and B cell receptors. And, and, and big thank you to, to Liz for helping you with these data sets. Um, the uh, basic, uh, and then, so, so in addition to these uh, predictive uh, improvements um, in perplexity um, over comparable methods, um, uh, we can also uh, learn interpretable latent space. So here I'm looking at PCA and to keep um, uh, uh, distances on an absolute scale, I'm looking at the PCA um, uh, uh, latent um, space with just two principal components. So um, T cell receptors uh, uh, develop according to this complex process of, um, uh, of uh, recombination um, in which uh, v, D, and J segments are randomly sampled from a, from a germline sequence and, and, you, and uh, stitched together um, uh, with some additional mutations um, uh, to generate the, the mRNA that you actually, uh, uh, to generate the sequence and then the mRNA that you actually see in the cell. Um, if you run, if you train a, a PPCA plus MUE model on this data set, um, the latent space organization reflects this complicated biology. So, here we see the um, C alpha and C beta, the, the alpha and beta type B TCR receptors separating in this latent space. If you go into the clusters, they're discriminated based on the V region types. Again, this is not information that's provided to the model. This is all learned in an unsupervised way. And, and the J region types, which are, which are smaller, are meanwhile distributed um, uh, sort of throughout this latent space representation in 2D. Um, so that was a latent space representation, um, but what's uh, particularly special about the MUE is that we can then project back into sequence space and we can look at um, sequences, um, uh, we, uh, we can look at variation at conserved sites. So we can still talk about um, uh, particular sites in a protein, we can still talk about how they change with respect to parameters of the model. And so here we project vectors from this latent PCA space back into sequence space and so, for instance, the vector separating the hyperplane, um, uh, uh, the vector um, uh, normal to the hyperplane between alpha and beta um, type uh, T cell uh, receptor chains um, uh, mainly affects uh, the portion of the um, sequence that is the uh, constant region, um, while the uh, uh, normal vector um, is mainly affecting the uh, uh, V region um, of this sequence. Um, I'll skip that. I, I um, last uh, want to return to this example of, of pathogen um, evolution. So uh, this um, uh, doesn't need much of an introduction in, in uh, today's day and age. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, here we'll 
or um, I, what I want to emphasize is that well, there's been um, quite a lot of work on understanding um, the, in, the evolution of things like influenza. Um, predictions have not yet come in the form of actual sequence forecasts, so they haven't actually been able to tell us what give us a distribution over sequences, tell us what sequences to sample or, or synthesize or, or test. And so MUI models provide an actual distribution, an actual forecast over future um, sequences. Um, so uh, we can show that building MUI models with um, a regression structure. So if you're starting with a linear regression model, augmenting it with a MUI, and now it becomes a, a distribution over sequences, um, uh, we can do better um, at forming um, predictions. And the model learns interpretable um, structure. So here we can look at, um, for instance, the coefficients of this regression model. We see substantial changes um, in sites of this uh, sequence that correspond to epitope um, regions, to classical epitope um, uh, regions. Um, we can also uh, build MUI models uh, or apply uh, latent space analysis um, type MUI models um, to uh, uh, this pathogen forecasting uh, data set. Um, and uh, here uh, we see a very different latent representation. Here we see that the latent space is organized by time. It's this linear structure, um, but there are some outliers. There are some sequences that look like they came from an earlier um, uh, time point, um, uh, but were observed much later. So here are two examples. Um, and so uh, in fact, these outliers, um, one comes from uh, contamination. So there's a way of, uh, uh, you know, we found that this uh, GIS, GIS AID uh, data set um, actually contains um, uh, some misannotated sequences. And this other um, uh, set of outliers um, comes from an outbreak of, of triple reassortant um, influenza, which had basically hopped from humans to pigs back um, uh, in the 90s, and then hopped back um, in 2010, having undergone not much evolution. Um, and so the latent space um, can reflect that kind of complex um, dynamics. Okay, so just to wrap up um, this part of the talk um, and return to Box's loop, um, uh, MUI models provide a strategy uh, for designing and building um, uh, uh, generative models of sequences. So you can start with any continuous vector model you want um, and add the MUI as a structured output to extend it to sequence data. Um, inference in MUI's is, models is, is completely compatible with um, uh, modern uh, 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 automatic um, inference techniques. Um, and uh, perhaps most crucially, un unlike in uh, the competitor um, MSA-based models, um, you can actually evaluate new output, model, new output models based on held out likelihood. You can compute Bayes factors, you can do um, uh, rigorous statistics, and you can trust uh, their generalization capacity. And finally, you can get through this loop pretty quickly um, uh, uh, thanks to uh, 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 Pyro um, and, and probabilistic programming languages. Okay, um, so with that, I'll, I'll briefly um, uh, pause and shift gears. Um, and so uh, in this next part of the talk, we'll return to some of the themes um, that Alan discussed uh, in the primer. And so this is a joint work um, uh, uh, equally with, with Alan um, and uh, obviously um, our advisor. Um, okay. So we've heard a lot here about uh, sort of protein scale, RNA scale models. Um, here I wanna uh, uh, think a little bit bigger um, and start to try and reach uh, the genome scale. And, and genome data, uh, sequencing data uh, or, or variants or you know, whatever sort of genome scale data you're thinking about um, is big. Um, not just big in the sense of tall, like there are many data points, but also wide. Sequences can be very long. Um, so here we're talking about 10 to the ninth length sequences, um, whereas before we were talking about um, uh, you know, hundreds of nucleotides. Um, and genome data is also complex, um, right? So it's not just uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, we also want to think about structural variation, and, and structural variation really can't be escaped um, uh, uh, especially in things like plants, 
Um, uh, but of course, as we've heard recently in MIA, um, uh, analyzing structural variation is crucial for understanding um, uh, humans as well. So when we think about um, genome scale probabilistic modeling, of course, uh, especially uh, this audience is probably familiar with, with many different types of genome scale um, uh, models, but uh, uh, things like structure or, or, or LDA. Um, but all these common uh, genome scale um, models rely on variant colors. So they're really not models of complete sequences. They're models of vectors of alleles that have been called based on sequence data. Um, in this talk, we're going to try and push down to the sequence level itself. So we're going to try and describe not just um, alleles, but full genomes and even, even read level um, uh, data. OK, this is really hard um, because sequences are long, as I mentioned before. Um, and so uh, a starting point, if you're coming at this um, from a statistics or MLIs, um, is to think about uh, uh, sequence models that might scale um, uh, to this ultra large scale. Uh, you might think about autoregressive um, models. So we saw an example of that in, in June's work. Um, these autoregressive models are highly scalable. They can be trained by um, stochastic gradient descent, and they work on both wide and tall um, sequence data. They're interpretable if you choose your autoregressive function appropriately, but they're parametric. Um, and what that means is that they can be susceptible to misspecification. And misspecification um, is a particularly severe challenge because genomes are both complicated. Um, so it's very hard to imagine a parametric model that might describe them. Um, and genome data is massive. And so that puts us in a regime um, where misspecification um, is a, a particular concern. So here's the idea. We had an autoregressive model where we predicted the next letter xi based on the previous L letters. And that relies on some categorical distribution um, distributed according to a parametric function of the previous L letters. Our proposal in this Bayesian embedded autoregressive models is to take that parametric autoregressive function and promote it to become not a parameter but a prior. So here, instead of predicting xij based on some deterministic function, we're going to say that xij is distributed. We're going to uh, uh, say that xij is distributed according to um, some categorical distribution that depends on another parameter v, and it's that parameter v that is drawn from a Dirichlet distribution. So the visual that should be in your head is if you're making a prediction based on the past L letters, instead of restricting that prediction to some particular value, fk theta, we're going to allow it to take any, um, uh, any value in the simplex. Um, and so this, this idea was inspired by um, this poetry embeddings um, that you saw in the prior. And it's the same pattern where we're going to take a parametric model and we're going to um, basically uh, uh, try and expand it into a non, relax it into a non-parametric model. Um, and we do so by introducing this concentration parameter, h. And when h goes to zero, this um, uh, Markov model construction is going to reduce to an AR model. So in the limit as h goes to zero, you can actually recover the embedded AR model. This parameter L is also important. This is the lag. And what's crucial is that we're going to put a prior on this lag that allows for arbitrarily large lag. So it has support up, up to infinity. Um, and and that, the fact that these conditional distributions are unconstrained and the lag is unconstrained is going to make this model flexible, as we'll, we'll prove rigorously in a few moments. Before going into how uh, this model works statistically, I briefly want to say something about how you do inference um, in this model. Just a quick comprehension question, Eli, if you don't mind. Yeah. So, so for a given um, amount of lag, uh, the simplex, the vertices of the simplex correspond to um, 
to kind of all the all the short sequences with that much lag, right? Yeah. Uh, the kind of the combinatorial space of, of that many. Yeah. Is that is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So so the analogy, the close analogy to the polya tree here is you should we're basically treating this k, the the lag, as like the partition epsilon. So this is the thing that controls where you are in the partition of the branching structure that allows for any um, uh, 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 you know, distribution. Um, and so here, instead of a beta distribution, we're using its generalization, a Dirichlet distribution, but we're controlling it with this one over H um, in the same way. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's, so that, that's very helpful. That's a good analogy. OK. Yeah. So, so right. So the connection is that this we're gonna we're we're no longer gonna think of um, trying to predict based on the um, uh, 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 kamer um, uh, based on the lag, um, uh, uh, though we still are doing that to some extent. The more important thing is that the k basically identifies a um, a context, and then we're gonna allow for any possible distribution in that context. And so you can imagine. Um, uh, with arbitrary large context, you can specify arbitrarily um, this sequence distribution. So um, this model uh, has tractable inference. Um, and in particular, the Dirichlet is conjugate to a categorical. Um, and so you can just compute a marginal likelihood conditional on L. And it reduces to a sum over Kamers in the data set. And it depends just on the summary statistic of this model, which is the CKB. So this is the Kamer counts, number of times you see Kamer K and B in your data set. We can build these matrices C of summary statistics very efficiently, even for terabytes of data uh, or larger using modern um, uh, techniques like KMC. Um, these are highly optimized out of memory um, Kamer counters. And crucially, there's this separability. The, the, you can decompose the um, uh, marginal probability of the data into a sum over um, Kamers. And so what that means is you can form stochastic gradient estimates of this marginal likelihood. So you can subsample these Kamers just the way you would subsample data in the context of an AR model. Um, you're subsampling Kamer counts. Um, and, and that lets you basically train this model not by a um, mar uh, uh, train this model via empirical base. You can optimize these hyperparameters, H, the concentration parameter, and theta, the parameter of the embedded autoregressive model, um, uh, uh, at very, very large scales. OK, so let's see this in actions uh, before we actually get into the, the theory here. So. Um, here we have some simulations. In the, the first simulation, the AR model um, that we've embedded is well-specified. Um, in the others, it's misspecified uh, with respect to the data generating distribution. This beta star is controlling some cross terms. Um, and this what we're measuring here is the KL divergence between the true data generating distribution and, and the model. Um, and so you can see as data set size increases, uh, uh, the when it's well specified, the AR model approaches the true data distribution. When it's misspecified, the AR model um, does not because it's misspecified. Um, the bear model, meanwhile, by doing this embedding trick, we allow for any possible um, distribution uh, over, uh, uh, over sequences. And so now the bear model is in fact uh, well specified. And so it converges to the true value. The embedding mechanism doesn't affect this asymptotic behavior. Um, so having this F theta, this AR um, uh, model embedded in the bear doesn't affect this asymptotic behavior, but it does affect the low data set um, performance substantially. So by having this F theta, we can get just as good low data set performance, but still maintain this non-parametric behavior. Um, and, and so that's um, uh, what's really special. Um, but mirror models don't just avoid misspecification. They don't just approximate the true um, uh, distribution. They also tell you when your embedded AR model is correct. So in fact, um, uh, they come with a diagnostic, H, um, that uh, converges to positive values 
um, uh, when uh, the model is misspecified and, and zero when the model um, is well specified. OK, so I'm going to briefly run through the theory um, behind uh, the bear model um, and how it works uh, in the context of both estimation problems first and, and then um, hypothesis testing problems. So, so density estimation is a really um, uh, uh, important um, problem, both for machine learning generally, um, but also particularly for biological sequences because of its connection to fitness estimation. So uh, to show um, uh, that uh, 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 the bear model uh, is a non-parametric um, density estimator, we first started by studying its expressivity. Um, and so what you can show is that um, uh, any distribution over finite sequences can be approximated arbitrarily well with a Markov model, um, like a bear model, um, provided your lags can be arbitrarily large. Um, and so technically, um, uh, the space of models accessible um, uh, by the bear, this M, is dense on the space of um, probability distributions over S, which is the space of distributions over finite sequences. And what I want to emphasize here is this expressivity holds for any sequence distribution, meaning that bear models can capture anything regardless of multimodality, epistasis, structural variation, etc. Okay, and so um, what we can is there prove... a kind of stationarity assumption there, though? I guess for small lags, it's like it matters more, and then as the lag gets as big as the sequence, it means nothing. But yeah, the trans exactly. is a translation thing, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so it's really crucial that this is some, so where the theory here um, differs from past theory around sequence models is that we're assuming sequences are finite. Um, so we're not asking about the long sequence limit. We're not asking about stationary. Right. Um, but and, I, I guess it somehow generalizes to infinite sequences with a stationarity assumption and, and some kind of, anyway. Thank yeah, you. it might, it might, but I think that, yeah, the, the, I mean, the source of a lot of this innovation, I mean, it, probably the reason it hasn't been studied before is simply that biological sequences, you don't want to study them in the long sequence limit, you want to study right. them as IID finite sequences, because that's much closer representation to what they are. Um, nice. Um, and so, okay, so, so, uh, uh, here, uh, the first theoretical result is that, um, in fact, despite the fact that this um, you're working with this infinite space over sequence distributions, the posterior of this bear model will in fact concentrate um, on uh, the true distribution um, uh, p star, regardless of what it is. And and to develop this theory, um, um, uh, uh, there uh, we develop new tools that handle, um, uh, for instance, uh, sub exponent. Um, uh, sub-exponential um, uh, uh, sequence distributions and, and some new tools for approximating them. Um, besides non-parametric um, density estimation, uh, we can also do robust parameter estimation. So uh, what this uh, uh, theorem says is that um, if you fit the AR model by an empirical Bayes, um, if your model is well specified, your parameter theta is entirely trustworthy and it'll give you an accurate um, uh, parameter estimate from empirical base. On the other hand, if your AR model is misspecified, H will converge to some non-zero value and that value um, will in general be proportional to the amount of misspecification. So when you fit bare models, you get not only a parameter estimate, but also some indication in H of whether or not you can actually trust that parameter estimate. And that I'm sorry. I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt you, Eli. We're out of time. We have one minute remaining. So if you will use that one minute to the best of your abilities, then there will be a 30 minute extended discussion afterwards. Yeah. OK, so so I won't go through the hypothesis testing applications then, unfortunately, though they're also exciting. Um, let me just uh, skip to, to the highlight. Does building this new expressivity model, expressivity into your AR model, actually pay off? Um, and the answer is it does, often by a very substantial margin. So uh, if you're analyzing whole genome sequence data, data um, uh, a conventional AR model uh, of the sort you might use in a machine learning application um, has a performance in terms of accuracy that's near chance. Um, embedding it in the, in the bare distribution 
um, increases it to actually practical levels. And, and this holds for whole genome sequencing read data sets, this holds for single cell RNA-seq um, data sets, this holds for metagenomics um, data sets as well. Um, bear models um, struggle um, on highly, highly diverse um, sequences, uh, unsurprisingly, um, but they still do better than um, uh, the alternative. Um, so uh, that's it, we can, oh, yeah, okay. So we can diagnose misspecification. Um, uh, so uh, just to, to briefly wrap up, um, bear models, um, you can embed any AR model to build a non-parametric bear. Um, you can train them at ultra large scale, uh, uh, hundreds of gigabytes in, in these experiments um, uh, uh, using uh, empirical bays. Um, and even if you don't care about bear models, you can also use them to design um, hypothesis tests. Um, so I didn't uh, get into the detail of that. Um, and finally, bear models are also easy to implement um, and, and train in modern autodiff systems. Um, okay, so with that, I'll just give uh, a brief acknowledgement. So, so this was work done um, with uh, Alan. Uh, uh, and I also want to thank um, the Broad Pyro team for the MUE implementation. Um, we got advice from a lot of um, uh, people that was really crucial. I want to highlight um, Rob Patra, who helped us build these large scale models and Liz um, uh, who helped with uh, uh, many of the data sets as well as um, Jeff who introduced me to the idea of um, these um, embedded polyetry models. Um, and thanks to the whole um, uh, Mark's lab.